So, Mama. Lily, hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm really good. Good, why? We're filming our podcast today for the first time, and we are in Topanga Canyon with the beautiful, inspiring Kate Shella, who we've been very excited to interview for a long time now. Mom, do you want to say a little bit about who Kate is? I'm just going to give you a little bit of a hint that she is a radical dancer and a shamanic healer. The reason that we don't like to say too much about a person in that way is because everything that we do with Style Like You, that our whole mission and, and the reason that we are just so incredibly excited to be here with Kate and with anyone that we interview is um, we just have a sense of a person and their comfort in their skin and the freedom with which they live their lives. Anyway, so Kate, <laughs> how are you feeling right now? Delighted. I'm kind of pondering on what has brought me to this extraordinary moment. And I knew from the age of three I wanted to work in fashion. My father had been in the rag trade making dresses for oversized women and all of my oh, wow. kind of family were worked in markets. And so fashion was a very, not high fashion, but fashion for the kind of, for the ordinary woman. And my mum designed a dress for women in the were in wheelchairs, so expressing oneself visually was always paramount to the way I lived my life from tiny. And so, and then when I finally got into the industry, which it didn't feel like an industry then, you know, in the late mm -hmm. 80s, it was a very different environment, and it was fueled by creativity, and it was fueled by independence. And, you know, I remember when I worked with Debbie L, she wanted to do a story about ribbon and wrapping, wrapping bodies, and and Sally Brampton, who was the editor at British Elle at the time, was like, fabulous. And whatever idea you had, whether it was about leaves, whether it was about carrots, whether it was, you know, it was just whatever the source of inspiration was, you could follow that. I stepped into a, a professional environment where the more creative you were, the better it was. And the more you were going to inform the world and the more you're going to inspire human beings to look at these magazines. And so when I worked with I, at ID or with Mark Le Bon, we did whatever the frig we wanted. There was no, um, there were no Formula. rules. Being a fashion stylist in New, in New York in the 80s, you were in London. Um, is the reason we a huge reason why we started Style Like You, hmm. because I had the same exact experience. It was a place of total discovery of myself and what true individuality and authenticity meant. Yeah, a fashion designer would have an idea, created a, a line whether it was out of a garbage can or wherever it was, and 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 have a show like in a in a dirty old garage somewhere. It wasn't like now where you go to like a Hertz rent-a-car center and have snobby people in black dresses with blonde ponytails and sunglasses looking down at you if you don't have a front row seat. It was the opposite. Yeah. And it was a place of so much creativity. And that was when I saw that change happen and I just saw this crashing down of pretension and negativity and clothing becoming something that's mean and making people feel excluded instead of a form of connection mm. and language mm. and celebration mm. I was I was sweeping mm. and that was and that's how we got together because li then Lily had her own side of the story of you know being curvy and not having the that you know the body and uh, that you know was you know the twiggy body yeah and, I mean, um, yeah I mean I remember that moment really clearly for me the more I was surrounded also by um, external beauty, what I felt like is I turned into the elephant man. I just felt that all my kind of internal stories and shame or self-doubt, I just felt like I got uglier and uglier the more I was surrounded by beautiful clothes and beautiful jewellery and beautiful makeup. And, and the people behind the scenes are all very ordinary. We've all come from extraordinary ordinary. I, my, that was my experience of all the people and phenomenal people behind the scenes and really an amazing community in the mm -hmm. fashion industry of creatives and eccentrics and unusual beings. But mm -hmm. it, it catalyzed me into going, there's something going on here that's not being addressed. What happened for me is the more money I made, the more money I went to go and study, and basically my greatest other passion besides fashion 
was dancing, you know, dancing and fashion were the things that got me through the world. And so I started to study about what it was to be in a body and to move creatively and to find a language in a physical way that I could share story besides dressing up the story through clothes. So that's where fashion and dance Hmm. really intersected for me. And I was never a good enough dancer to become professional, which is what I always wanted. And I realized I was saved from that because that's another environment. Perfection. Perfection and what's right and how do you look and starvation and all and also all in the name of becoming kind of hollow to convey a story and you know there's something profoundly moving about that um but I really wasn't ever into the torture bit because Mm. my mind tortured me enough Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I loved food too much too I always loved food and so I realized I kind of what the things that I was passionate about in some ways I was saved from diving into them for my entire life so I never became a full-time kind of fashion stylist at a magazine which was my dream growing up or becoming a full-time dancer I turned everything around in the name of how can I support people becoming more of who they are and finding their individuality and finding their creative path and finding their vision so they can be of service to themselves and then hopefully to the planet and that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years really um although I've been doing I realize my entire life my best friend when I was at school at the Lycée in London every Wednesday she would come home with her sister and I'd make her take all her clothes off and I would dress her up again because I was fascinating in recreating what somebody was and helping them see themselves in a very different light and I think at the center of fashion or style or is that how do you dress up your soul which is what brings me to my question I've right. been wanting to ask which is <laughs> what does your style say about you oh I always felt that my style was communicating, well, a sense of humor, I think is vital. Mm -hmm. Also a sense of being comfortable and being willing to not be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been something that's been paramount for me is that I'm willing to stand up in my own right, even if it makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, What are moments where it'll make you feel uncomfortable, like depending on the setting you're in? Well, I suppose, for instance, like when I cut my hair really short, you know, I had 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 long... So my mum got sick nine years ago. My mum was diagnosed with cancer and um, it was a radical transformation in our whole lives. And when she came through that and was given the all clear, I felt like I needed to make some kind of declaration about what we'd gone through. And I'd been dyeing my hair and I had long black hair and I just felt like every, every month I had to kind of put tar on it. And it just was like, this isn't who I am. How long was it? It was, it was really long, like down to my chest. And none of, like none the dye of, is what you're saying was tie was, was tar. It was tar. I just felt like I was just putting tar on. And one day I looked in the mirror and I went, this isn't who you are. And I just cut my hair to kind of my shoulders and my family said I look like a King Charles Spaniel and I should go and get a haircut and I was the kind of woman that if I cut an inch off my hair it was short because my hair was definitely part of my identity as a symbol of femininity Mm. and sweetness and sensuality and also having grown up with the idea that as a Jewish woman your hair is your crowning glory and your hair carries all your stories and so hair I think for a lot of people is very much um, associated with your with your stories and so I was aware I was holding on to my stories so I had a lovely lovely student and friend Ava who'd been wanting to take me to see her hairdresser for a very very long time and one day I went in and I'd cut my hair and I just went Ava you need to take me to your friend because I just I look horrendous and my hair and my gray had started to grow out and I just looked appalling And um, she took me to meet this extraordinary woman called Geneva. And um, the first thing Geneva said to me is, I don't want you to really look at yourself and why you're here and what's the journey you've been on. And basically just wanted to hear my story. And neither of us knew what was going to happen. And and within a very short period of time, I just said to her, I just want you to shave off one side. And she was like, okay, Kate, you know, when you shave off your hair, (laughs) you can't like just pull it back and it grows like one of those dolls that you could pull the hair out of the top Mm. of its head. And I went, just do it. And she shaved off one side of my head and I was like, oh, and then she did the other. And it was the first time I think in my life. So that was what I was 40, 41, where I looked at myself and I went, you're beautiful. And I went, and there you are. You so, had shaved the two sides like now? Yeah, I mean, it's not as, and then nowhere the rest was near long, as drastic. No, no, no. I mean, basically, it was more kind of like a gentle Elvis quiff. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a zero or a one. It was probably a two. 
But it was drastic from having had long hair my entire life since wow. I was 13. And also when I was 13 and I had cut my hair off, I was always called a boy because I was very late to develop. I was this really skinny, gawky thing. So I think I always had that alliance with the word, like, I'm going to look really masculine. And it's definitely changed how pe- I'm perceived. I mean, it's What's hardcore. your household? People could perceive me utterly as a queer woman. So that's been really fascinating going, gosh, you changed your hair and suddenly people are judging you around your sexuality. And so that was very new to me. I mean, white heterosexual men completely disappeared off the whole face of the earth. Oh, really? Yeah. Weren't pursuing you. Wow. No, 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 no. It was just like, you're obviously a queer woman. I'm not even going to say hello to you. I'm not going to talk to you. How does that feel? How did that transition? Well, it feels very, very sad and it feels incredibly judgmental. And it feels like you don't know a thing about me based on the way I look. And yes, I know that for a lot of people, the way they look conveys a lot of different things, but it could could be conveying the absolute opposite too. Um, African-American men and women are always telling me how fabulous I look. And that's been gorgeous. When did the gray, when did you let that happen? The gray probably started after I gave birth to my son. You know, that um, the kidney depletion, basically. And, Wait, um, how old's your son? So my son is 15. But so where did you let it, the gray out 15 yeah. years oh, ago? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so people, when was the haircut? So the haircut was about nine years ago. Oh, so that was your already was, all gray by then. I was all, not all gray, but definitely, you know, threads of the silver coming okay. through. And I loved it. I was like, yes, nice. And um, I realized I don't, I don't mind aging. I love people that are older Mm -hmm. and aging beautifully and naturally and gracefully I love wrinkles I love silver hair I love character and then people were like oh have you thought about dying yet and I'm like I would never die I would never die and then I realized that then became a position so at some point I dyed it because I just thought let's see what it looks like and I was like you dyed it when it was short no 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 and it was still long Long. and that was was when you were putting the tar that's the tar thing so I just Mm -hmm. think also that thing of going not being attached to a position and um I mean, I think for me, cutting my hair symbolized a moment in my life, okay, of coming into my 40s of my mom and my family and our world having shifted on its axis, having experienced something that people are experiencing every single day, every minute of the day in the world, like nothing unusual about cancer or, you know, sickness or the, the facing death or facing what it is to really love people and to lose them. And so cutting my hair was this absolute, again, another threshold crossing of going, I'm going to discover something deeper about myself and risk. Because I think I've been a risk taker in many ways. Mm. But in my, with my hair, I'd never been a risk taker. I'd basically been a North London Jewish girl and um, a Stepford wife. And so doing this has just really catapulted me into my true nature in a way. And every time I've tried to grow it, it just goes, I go, Aah! I can't, I just can't do it. It's like, no, that's not who you are. And who knows in the future what will happen, but I, I'm a bit of a punk rocker really. And if I was a singer in a band, I'd be spitting on the audience for sure. Um, so I like that it it kind of conveys that. And yet also, I think when you shave your head, you're also experiencing a deeper level of vulnerability because you are fully exposed and you're so much more sensitive. And I understand why nuns and monks have a shaved head, not to say that I'm a nun or a monk, but just as a spiritual or a psychic or an energetic experience, it's very, very different. A sense of being. Can you explain much that? More... Like, can you give a detail of that? Well, it's very visceral too. I mean, when you have let, hair, keeps you warm. In, in terms of sensation, you can feel the wind on your scalp, and you can feel heat and cold, and you can hear things in a much more acute way. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a layer of protection that's just gone. Did it change your style at all? I think it's really allowed me to be even more eccentric. And what are there other assumptions that people make about you based on your style besides the queer assumption? Very confident. I think also that, if you're that very, sounds true. Yeah, no, but I do think if you dress loudly, people just think you, that you're only brave and courageous. And I think also people bra- wear clothes as an incredible defense mechanism and as a great way mm-hmm. to actually keep people away. I think people are looking at each other rather than seeing each other. So for instance, one can be judged right. as old because one has silver hair, but I'm going, but are you really seeing this person? Are you looking into their eyes? Are you taking them in? Exactly. And I do think we're living in a, in, in a culture a lot of the time and not too, but where people are wanting to present a mask all the time. And I think those of us that are willing to be more experimental on the outside, like show our experience, show our journey, th- show our thoughts, show our passions, show our loves, 
we're risking and we're also we're asking it's an invitation i think too often can we allow ourselves to play and experiment and and be alive while we're here it's so important and if we could all wake up to that it's it's like exactly what our whole we're just so driven to get people to understand this that you have the ability and you're you're, you're given a life you're given a body and what are you doing with this life like every day and style is a part of that mm. how you mm. because it is a form it is a political it is a message it is a form of connection or disconnection it's a it's a conscious thought in terms of what you're putting on what where did you get it what does it mean to you it's all it all matters mm. Well, and it's, and it's and also, it's just, I think it's play. And I think we've And all, it is play. And I think it's, it's play. Totally but I always, fun. But I also yeah. think, depending on the situation that you've grown up in or where you live, it's also, I, at some part of me wants to go, it's also a privilege. It's like, mm-hmm. I realize, you know, holding containers for people to, to dance for three days and to take some time to ponder about their lives is a privilege. And a lot of people in the world don't have the time to even think about how they're feeling or what's happening or to consider because it's survival. And Mm. so I'm also aware of that. And I think that's what's so important about what you've brought into the culture is that everyone, no matter where they come from, no matter how wealthy, how, you know, whatever their circumstances, want there's a desire to express what's on the inside and put it on the outside. What do you think is the biggest risk you've ever taken? Well, just moving to Los Angeles in, you know, 91, because I met a meditation teacher I wanted to study with, and I was working at Elle, and I was on this real trajectory of becoming a fashion editor, and Mm -hmm. so all that security, I just moved here, and I didn't know anyone except this one woman and my parents' dearest old friends who lived here, who I lived with, but so that was a huge risk, and not having a job, and starting to meditate with this circle of people every day and realizing my whole life was transforming because I was committing to my inner path, having committed very much to the kind of exterior, but working on the inner. So that was a massive risk. And then moving back to England when I met my now husband to bring up his younger son. So um, you went back from LA, back, yeah, back you to, met him so here. I, so I met him here and then I moved to New York um, to study with, to get to be closer to my teacher at the time, Gabrielle The meditation Roth. teacher? No, she's oh. my, my kind of embodiment teacher. Um, so were you dancing the whole time? Yeah, the whole time. So I've been dancing pretty much, was I've always, danced my entire life. It was always a hobby, but it wasn't like the career When you say hobby, it was just if, it was I part think of if you. I couldn't dance, I would be dead. It's my breath, it's my life, it's the way I transform everything that I don't understand and it's my spiritual practice, it's my ally. Um, you know, I used to dance in my bedroom with Elvis. He wasn't there really, but I thought he was. Dancing has been my, I would say, has been my savior. So when I met Gabrielle Roth in my early 20s, she embodied so much of that, but with very much coming from a very shamanic perspective and a healing perspective, but also she was an absolute fashionista and loved literature and art and creativity and indigenous culture. And so when I met Gabrielle, it brought all of these things that I was passionate about into one lens and surrounded by extraordinary, unusual people that are on a transformational path in the name of healing oneself so one could be of service. I mean, that's what's always been my intent. I always knew that whatever I was doing for myself, I had to pay it forward. And were you actively like trying to be a professional dancer? Or was oh, like yeah, a and then I gave up oh. very, you know, I was told I would never be the person that could do it backwards and at the speed of light. And so don't waste your time. You're a great dancer, but don't try and be a professional dancer. And it was heartbreaking, but it was actually the biggest favor the teacher gave me at the time. When was that? How old were you? And I was where, probably where? like, I don't know, 16. Okay, so really young. Yeah. So you gave up Was that. it like ballet? What, what no, kind of no, no. I mean, just, you know, like going to the place and, you know, when you do all those routines and when you're leaping across the room and just it's a very specific body and mind that becomes a professional dancer. And I just wanted to dance. And so then I went, just go clubbing, which is what I did. And I went clubbing a lot and would go there and dance and not drink and not smoke and not talk to anyone, but just fucking dance and then get the night bus home and so when I moved to America and I started styling I met someone and then also through my meditation circle I met someone that mentioned Gabrielle's name to me and at the time something went off in my mind because I realized that I'd gone to a workshop when I was about 16 and someone had mentioned her name then so there was this knowing of the name and very very quickly I found myself in one of her workshops in New York and it was like a coming home and meeting her and the family and why? the tribe. Like, why was it coming home? 
like what happened? I mean, the was it I, called Five Rhythms then? Yeah, I mean, it okay. is called Gabrielle yeah. Roth created the Five Rhythms practice. Oh, okay. um, and when I went into, when I arrived there, I just felt my outline had been waiting for me, is what I would say. Because it, it brought together all the things I knew dance was. You know, dance for me was an absolute form of expression and storytelling and transformation and healing and fun and sexy and passion and community and yeah it was basically my language and so being in a room where that was being articulated and understood and there was maps and it was broken down and there were loads of other people that wanted to show up that and be present with it rather than you're on a dance floor where everyone's smoking and it's about a lot of other things absolutely about self-expression but without this absolute sense of the intent of what we're doing because I knew I went dancing because that allowed me to keep living my daily life and for me that's what I think creativity and and poetry and magic and spirit is is how do we make sense of things and for me when Mm -hmm. I move everything makes sense there's no past there's no present there's no future there's just the the eternal now it's this it's this humming vibration of all knowingness And so stepping into that for a very, very, very long time and putting all the money from styling into any workshop, any class, and then eventually the training with Gabrielle, you know, all my money, I invested my money in myself. Um, And I taught her work. Would you say that was a risk? I probably, I didn't think of it as a risk. I mean, I remember getting a really big job with somebody and choosing to go and do a workshop with Gabrielle and her being like, Kate, you know, you should have done the job. It was amazing, the opportunity. And I was like, no, no, no not as important as this that became the focus and the passion and the knowing that some other pathway had opened up for me um and the, the more I was in fashion and then I was in advertising and doing all that and going selling socks or or Colgate and going I I wouldn't even buy these products and you mean doing the styling for them yeah to make just money going, I don't care about this what I care about mm. is also the community I was always the person on sets that people shared their stories with or shared their secrets with. And I realized that's why I loved wardrobe eventually. It was the tribal setting. It was never really about what mm-hmm. I was doing to make money. And then I just felt like a high-class prostitute. And I right. went, you know, I hate what I'm doing. Just pay me more money. And then eventually I just went, I can't do this anymore. And overnight I couldn't get a gig. It was really incredible. I was at this kind of apex of it happening and I turned my back to it and the door shut one once and for all and so when well, you, you made think- the shift you stopped getting yeah offers yeah it was like immediate immediate like the spirits went okay great yeah you're right on time this is not what you're supposed to be doing anymore oh, wow it was very i, I mean, mean i sort of very swift that was style like you similar right like very the similar. doors were just shutting yeah, yeah. it's like no you shouldn't be spending you, your time were you doing you this panicked or were you calm i had a moment of going Rrr! and then I think somewhere I have a deep trust in myself and I probably am not really even aware of it that the next beautiful thing is going to arrive and and it did um but I mean I never I you know I didn't make as much money I mean that's the other thing that people stay in that industry because when you get to a certain level you can make a heck of a lot of money but you also have to sacrifice your own sense of integrity I think um unless you're those few people that really can stay in the creativity of it i was done i was done i didn't want to be working in that way anymore i wanted to be working with people's soul really really openly i didn't want to be in the closet about it and i think for me that's what i would say all the work is about is about how to help people come out of their own closet how to help people come out of their own spaces of shame into a space of sharing and then thriving can you explain like what happens in that space the spaces that you contain so what's what's super exciting for me at this point is having been a five rhythms teacher for getting on for 25 years my colleague and dear friend and ally amber ryan and i have created a new body of work called the 360 emergence and but what she and i do we are we are embodiment teachers so what that means you come into a room and you're going to dance you're going to dance your tits off it's like the best club that you could ever possibly go to with the best people you could possibly ever go to And the whole intention about coming into a room where you're moving is that you're seeking to embody your mind, you're seeking to embody your heart, you're seeking to embody your stories, and to transform whatever needs to be transformed through speaking through the body. And it's about developing awareness, developing a sense of identity with how you feel, coming out of numb, hopefully developing a connection with other and being able to communicate through dance, having a conversation like you and I are, but by moving and not talking through the mouth, but talking through the whole body. 
And what that seems to do for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are dancing in so many different ways around the world with an intent is it brings you more joy, number one. It brings you more sense of connectivity. It brings you a sense of equanimity and harmony. It changes the kind of chemistry of your mind and your body. And you feel a sense of union with yourself and you catch up with the speed of life and you get present. And then hopefully then you leave those classrooms or those workshops or those containers and you can live the life that you want to live and you can behave the way you want to behave and you can become more aware of the behavior that's unconscious to you. What would you say has been your biggest struggle and the thing that sort of has most driven you to need to transform that through dance? What is the connection between those two things? I've struggled with the fact that I don't really see a lot of people like me. I mean, that's what I don't, I don't feel that as much now. I mean, there's definitely that character that will always exist, that will always feel like, well, I don't have the same opinion, or I don't look like that, or I don't smell like that, or I don't eat like that. Can you give an example of where you, you know, feeling like an outsider and, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit in the fashion industry. You well, know. just being too passionate, being too sensitive, being too outspoken, being T-O-O, like too much of anything, being too colorful, being too sad, being too poetic, being too romantic. So where has being like that intense, passionate, truth-seeking person, where has it been hard? I remember one specific um, teaching situation, um, which was a residential one. And um, this was, I just want to say, this was a very long time ago. (laughs) But um, something happened in the group where I said something or I behaved in a certain way with the group. And the whole group basically went, uh, 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 and held a council, held a circle, and told me about what they didn't approve of in the way that I was teaching. And I had to sit there and listen to every single person in that circle tell me and share with me very explicitly where I had been out of order. And it crossed a boundary? Crossed a boundary with words or with how I, you know, I can't even remember. It was just about something that I had said that the whole room just went, uh uh-uh. uh. And I sat there and I listened to probably about 25 to 30 people telling me what had wow. not worked. And I sat there and I listened to every single person. And you can imagine I felt <sighs> profound shame. Wow. Um, I wanted to die. I did not, and also remember, we're all in the same place for five days. There is no going home. And you're home, the teacher. And I'm the teacher. And I have fucked up, you know, and it was clear. And Did you, you felt right away that they were right? Like absolutely. you saw it. There yeah. was no, what were some of the things they were saying? All I, all I know, it wasn't even what they said. It was just being in that container of going, I've made a mistake. And I have to sit here and I have to listen to them telling me what I have done wrong. And I remember going back to my room that night and you can imagine just going, right, I'm going to get in a cab and disappear and they're never going to see me again. And having to wake up the next morning and go back into the room and be the person that is holding the space Mm. and feeling like I've completely lost respect. They've lost respect for me. I've completely lost respect for myself. I'm on my back foot. I mean, it was a profound being... I I just like you're completely cauterized you know you're like a peach that's been cut in four and going back into the room and teaching and holding the space and then in the break every single person in that room thanking me because I had sat there and I had listened to them and I had put it into what I call like my laboratory my body and recycled it and taken it on and there was a woman in that group who was probably at that time in her late 50s and an incredibly powerful woman, a CEO of a company, I remember. And she came up to me and she said, that was the most amazing thing. She said, you're, you are a teacher because you sat here and you listened to all of us and you've put it into the work. And we ended up having the most incredible rest of the week. And that was a real turning point for me because I think I got in that moment that I will make mistakes. I will that there is no doubt about it and I will make mistakes in a professional context in a personal context in a private in a public context but if I can sit and listen to where I've gone wrong and really taking it in and assimilate it and work from that place then then there's hope for me as a human being and there's hope for us and I've realized that You know, we're in a culture that a lot of people give their power away to people with authority and they don't question and they don't say, 
that's fucking out of order or no, you know, or even yes. And I think the minute you're, you're given power, you, you have to be profoundly <laughs> humble with it. And that's what I've learned is that I'm allowed to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. I'm allowed to say sorry too. Like, I think that's, it's like Desmond Tutu says, the most difficult three words to say in the English vocabulary are I am sorry. And I learned that in that moment. It went in so deeply. And I thank every single one of those people in that room that changed my life and that taught me that, you know, careful, you have to be careful here. What is the sort of inner struggle or block right now in your life that you're working t- through and in, in order to kind of like step into your power <laughs> in this moment? It's mm-hmm. such a massive question. It's mm. fantastic. I, I think for me, and I think for probably a lot of um, people on the planet right now, it's am I willing to dare to be my full self? And I think as a, as a mm. woman in 2019, there's this real sense of, for me, it's not even that the future is feminine, the future is fluid. So can I fully step into all that wants to move through me and do I have the courage to do that like doing this is a real edgy thing for me because I'm coming out of my own closet it's like the part of me that wants to be really articulate that wants to be very detailed with what I'm saying that wants to communicate how much beauty is available to the every person Mm -hmm. you know I I feel very much Mm -hmm. like my work is about reaching the extraordinary and ordinary humans that we all are. You know, we've come from very humble backgrounds and are doing extraordinary things. We're not special. And so the part of me that goes, I have a very important voice. And do I have the courage to stand inside of that and not shy away from that? And I think that's something I often dance with. It's who does the work, those that can, and I know I can, and I know I'm here, like all of us, to play a part in shifting the cells of the culture um, through creati- through creativity and through creating containers for people to come together and do deep work that then goes out into the world and ripples out. And I think, you know, big block is just shame. Like, why me? Like, And there's a voice in me, as I said to you earlier, who the hell do you think you are? You know, and as a woman, it's very challenging Mm -hmm. to just go, is this okay? Is this Mm -hmm. okay? And, um, and just as a human being, is this okay? And who am I? You know, I'm Mm -hmm. a girl from North London, all my ancestors, you know, lived through the Second World War, and many of them perished. And so there's, there's this real sense of feeling a little bit embarrassed. And then but underneath that is like so much excitement, like, oh, I'm just an ordinary Kate. And all of us ordinary folk are the people that are really making the change in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see that through what you're doing, all the extraordinary people you meet, the courage and if the bravery. Not, if mm-hmm. not you, who? Yeah. When you look at all of the amazing things that have happened in the world, that's how they've happened. You know, it's, it, it's because you just will not stop. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's risk, express. isn't it? It's, it's risking. And I think I've come to this point where I can't, I can't hold myself back and I'm not holding myself back. So what are some of the other edges like right now? Like, so this is an edge. You know, loving the way I look more or being more respectful towards myself or really knowing. Like in what way? Like respectful? Just kind words. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, for a very long time I would wake up and the first thing I would hear is, I hate you. You're Mm -hmm. ugly. You know, you're stupid. Mm -hmm. So it's. What did you think was ugly or stupid about yourself? Like what? I mean everything the entire thing you know the annihilator inside doesn't doesn't even pick it just goes you're not even worthy of being here and Mm -hmm. I think you know having done the work that I do with many people that's such a strong voice in in so many people's heads for so many different reasons and it's crippling and yet the, the the cripple in me or the part of me that identified with the elephant man from a very young age when I saw that film it changed my entire life because I did feel I was seeing myself on screen what, describe that what do you mean so like the just elephant. visually I mean when I remember my brother and I saw that film when I was about 10 and it was I mean I know now it was all prosthetics but that this human being had existed with this level of deformity but this level of profound sensitivity and tenderness and it extraordinary intelligence I felt I was witnessing an aspect of my psyche that it was a relief 
to, to see that. That's why I was always obsessed with Francis Bacon's work because he was conveying the mutilated internal vision we have of ourselves. And I identified as that visually. So you felt deformed and mutilated? Oh, like what? You're, I'd love to hear like the, what the inner voice says. Because to me, I look at you and my assumption is because you're so strong in your expression and you're and you see it's like pure is, beauty but yeah but also confident like that, that i would never assume that you had but those i voices. think i have both you know yeah I, I mean, yeah, yeah. So do, but also right. also that vo the vulnerability is the confidence like, i know but is, so i'm yes. curious because i think it's important oh, everything to share, like, from, like, you know, like, yes, i wish you did I mean, i remember i look I, I remember looking in the mirror and going oh you don't look like penelope cruz <laughs> you know it's that thing or i mean and all my sheroes you know nina simone billy holiday um James Brown, I mean, Beyonce now, I have to say, I'm just in awe of her. I mean, watching her on screen, for me, just is a full-blown yes, because we all have an inner Beyonce, every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And um, But just, oh, you look too Jewish, oh, your nose is wonky, oh. And also, having come from the fashion industry, your legs aren't straight. You're, and you just go, God, oh my, the level of internal criticism, and yet what's so remarkable is I don't have that going on outside of me. It's like I look at most people really and go, oh, I, all I see is the beauty. So my internal critic is so, so self-deprecating. And so at some point, my dear friend Sybil Buck, who you know, said you have to actively work on that as if you were going to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to work on that voice mm -hmm. because that can't go on. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years. Every morning I've woken up and if I hear that voice, I immediately turn it to the extreme of, I love you, you're beautiful, I care about you, you're kind, you're healthy. Just you really kind of taking away mm -hmm. the, the negative self-talk and shifting it on its axis and it's made a huge difference. And do you feel that that is in any way related, like that negative self-talk in the from a beauty standpoint, is any way related to the healing that you feel when you're dancing? Like when I'm dancing, I just know I am the most extraordinary, beautiful, mm -hmm. powerful, incredible human being on the planet, and I've always felt that. Mm -hmm. When I'm dancing, I don't have you, that voice. And especially and in then, the, the style of dance that you're like doing it there's not a mirror and it's not no, really no no right? there's no mirror no I mean in fact it doesn't no one really cares what it looks like it's really what it feels about and it's about you know finding the alphabet of the mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. um so f that was the place where I always that was my antidote and that's where I would always find this other landscape and of course I wanted to go this is the masses need to be doing this because you know I go can you imagine if people were dancing every day in the White House mm -hmm. you know people go oh Donald Trump yeah he's he's bless him he's a lunatic but I have an internal lunatic I have an internal character I have characters inside of me that could do horrible things that can think horrible things and I have to own that and I for me the work that's important is how do we bring that level of polarization together because mm -hmm. my experience time and time again is you bring people together that don't think they have anything in common that don't have anything to say to each other that judge each other and within a few hours that can just shift in a in on its axis if it's in the right context and mm -hmm. so and of course, if you're a sociopath, that might not be the case. <laughs> but I don't believe anyone is beyond help. So with the inner critic, has it come up with the aging process and like the changes in your physically that are happening? Has that been a struggle? I mean, I think parts, but not extremely, because I think the voices have been so negative for so long that it, it doesn't even go, oh, you've got older, although I, I'm aware I've got older. Mm -hmm. There's less and less critic about getting older because simultaneously I feel more empowered and more present than I ever have been as I've got older and mm -hmm. as I am getting older. And I actually, I, it's funny, I had a palm reading in um, London last year and she said, oh, she said, you're 48. And I was like, yes. And well. she goes, you know, most people that come in here at 48, their life's over. They've done it. They're finished. They feel dried out, hollow. And I went, really? Like, I was so shocked that she said that to me. She goes, you, you're just beginning. And that's how I feel. I feel I've, act, I've got to this point where I'm going to dive off mm -hmm. and that potentially the next 40 years are going to be even more exquisite and exciting than the last 50. Mm -hmm. um, I feel exactly the same way. And that feels very it's delightful. It's just begun. You just, yeah. As time goes on, you just feel more like yeah. it's just begun. Yeah. Like a but, and I think my, you know, my mum and dad have definitely um, 
mirrored that to me. Mm -hmm. And they would say in their 80s that it's not so fun to be achy and not have as much vitality, but they're still traveling all over the world. They're still madly in love. They're still incredible. I hold so much sense of joy and purpose and and grace and generosity. And so I have incredible role models Mm -hmm. and their friends. And also in my life now, I have friends of lots of different ages where that is being mirrored back. It can it can stay sweet and juicy and delicious. And, and also if you stay in motion, everything stays in motion. Your mm-hmm. heart keeps moving, your soul keeps growing. And, and mm. if you have community, I think anything's possible. And that's the greatest gift I've received. When was the last time you cried? Oh. Well, a few minutes ago. But when was the last you time almost I cried? cried a few minutes uh, so ago. My, oh, during my, the interview? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was almost notice. crying. Too. I didn't catch that. So the last time I really cried, my elder son was here with us um, um, a couple of weeks ago for his 30th birthday. And we had a really profound moment. Actually, he was sitting in the chair you're sitting in and I'm sitting in this chair. And just a very, very deep moment so where we he, were sharing tears together. He what was, was it about? the son that, that, that you raised of your husband? Yeah, so he's not my blood body son, but he's my son. And um, he came into my life when he was six years old and he's now 30. Wow. And we were, I'm not privy to share that with you, but it was a very deep, beautiful, sacred moment where the two of us were crying openly together and sharing wow. some very deep territory. And um, Well, that's a beautiful thing you did. Well, it's what we did together. What's your biggest fear? Oh, oh God. (laughs) Of being physically attacked. Why that? I mean, I understand that that's very scary, but why is that rising to the top of the list? Because it's just very real. It's something I live with. I I mean, I don't know any woman that doesn't on some level, but, you know, physical violence and sexual violation is something I'm very frightened of. Yeah. Has it ever occurred to you or? On, yeah, in some degrees, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and does that fear, like, are there moments where that fear comes up more intensely than others? Yeah, I mean, like, like when you actually really ask me and I really go in, that's the, that's the truth of just, yeah, being, I think any, you know, brutality is it's something I'm really frightened of. Um, and yeah, there are moments like right now, if I drop into that, yeah, it's like, okay, can we change the subject? Because it mm-hmm. feels very real. But does it permeate every single moment of my life? No, but there are moments where it comes up. You know, I grew up in the 70s where you hit your kids. You know, it was very accepted. I was hit at school by teachers. I was hit by neighbors. I was hit by my parents, by my brother. And so I have a very, you know, there's definitely a character in me that's kind of gets uh, about physical violence. Mm. Um, and it's impacted my nervous system. You know, I think all the work one does and can do in certain moments, those triggers or those experiences are, are there in present time. And so I go, okay, it's not happening now, but my nervous system is just happening. And what do you do about that? Or How what, do you handle or that? what is a trigger, like an example of a trigger? Well, it might be a situation where I, you know, I mean, it was, it was very interesting. In the early days when I danced with Gabrielle, there would be a particular woman in the dance class um, that every dance class we were in, I would get hit by her very gently, but I'd get hit. Just, just like she would not mean to, like, yes, brush but you know, you. like, you yeah, know, just like it's... something like I'd get tr- my foot or my uh, hand or my shoulder, and it would always kind of trigger something in me because anything like that unexpected touch mm-hmm. is not something I'm, I'm very into. Um, and this would happen for. It happened for quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I was in a class in New York when I was living in New York and it happened. And the woman accidentally just tapped me on my nose. And out of nowhere, I started to scream and shout at the top of my lungs. At her? Just no, not at Mm -hmm. her. Just this, I don't know, just this ignition, this wave of rage, just screaming. And you can imagine it's quite a small class and everyone's having this wonderful time and suddenly there's this woman in the class (laughs) having a complete and utter raging fit. (laughs) And the teacher at the time, Marianne, kind of beautifully danced over and was just being there present with me because I I carried on dancing, but I was screaming at the top of my lungs, like, you know, loads of expletives and... And probably within about less than 60 seconds, it had passed and I carried on dancing and it never, ever, ever, ever happened ever again. 
So this beautiful mm. woman was in service to something that I couldn't activate. And I think that's also what we're, we're in service to be each other as human beings. We're here to help activate things that might feel difficult. But if we can keep working with them, that hopefully mm-hmm. we'll get to the other side and we'll get to the meadow where the flowers are. And so there are situations where, yeah, that gets activated. Or if I'm on the street on my own in the dark, I just there's a, you know, a heightening of my nervous system that gets peaked. And am I safe? And, and you know, it's been a very, 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 very long time since anything like that has happened. Um, but now when What's it that? does, you know, there's been a couple of moments in workshops, which has been interesting, where a, a couple of men have been one man in particular was quite physical with me and that same sensation dancing with you no he as a teacher I had to go and talk to somebody and to tell them very clearly they couldn't move like that because it was quite dangerous they were doing a lot of karate chops in the air and they nearly kicked someone in the head so it's my duty as code of care to go up to that person and go you know please can you just keep your feet on the ground so everybody's safe and he turned around and he grabbed me very 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 hard and he was hurting me and in that split second of him doing that and my brain going if he doesn't let go of me in a split second I'm going to scream blue murder and some uh, simultaneously again that same sensation but so deep from my core came up and I just made this sound it was just like this grunt like basically you get your fucking hands off me motherfucker and I just made the sound and he just he let go and he ran out of the room. And it was the class? He ran, it was a workshop. It was a five-day workshop. And he did not come back. And then other stories emerged about this gentleman wow. in the community. And there was a bit of an intervention and a discussion that went down. But So that was the last time something like that's happened. And what I was able to realize in that moment is I now have the resources that I will never let those things ever happen to me again, right? Um, and I think that's the thing as, as anyone that's experienced physical violence or uh, an experience that's made one feel very frightened one feels powerless and one feels voiceless and I think that's what's so incredible about what's going on in the culture not just for women but for all beings to be able to stand up and say that's not okay Mm -hmm. and that's the beginning of healing and as I say that I can feel how my voice wants to disappear because it's about naming something that feels so scary to to Mm -hmm. name in the culture and in our families and in our communities and you know i I myself i'm finding my own voice as Mm -hmm. we all are what's your biggest source of shame that you feel you you could use a release from self-doubt i have you know really so much self-doubt um what are you doubting at the moment we haven't really gotten into i guess like the this is it a scary moment for you to be stepping away from five rhythms and into your own practice? Or I don't think it's scary in terms of leaving the five rhythms because the truth is the five rhythms have given me the most incredible structure mm-hmm. and the beauty of the map that Gabrielle created and the beauty of the community and the beauty of the friendships. And, you know, I met my husband through the five rhythms. Mm-hmm. I met some of my best friends through the five rhythms. So it's, it's just an extraordinary it's it's part of who I am. It's part of who I am. So it's not scary leaving that. What's scary is that it's more about I'm now stepping into more of who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm not hiding behind um, a form that has... A lot of co- weight in the culture. And well, like, yeah, yeah. And that really, you know, something that works. And something that's been yeah. working for 25, 30, 40 mm-hmm. years. It's been established. And so here I am, you know, like little baby <laughs> dragon going... Rrr, rrr, and so that's kind of exciting and mm-hmm. scary and going, well, do you have the legs to stand up on this? And, and that's why I love the fact that it's called the 360 emergence is that everything is always emerging and everything is always an emergency. And so there's this kind of the polarization of that we're in, a, in a, an emergency in terms of what's happening in the culture. But through that, what is emerging in terms of the arts and creativity mm. and language and conversation and dialogue hope I mean you know in parts of the world that we never ever thought this was going to happen what's happening in the Middle East with and women's rights and I, with LGBTQ community I just feel like there's so much rising mm-hmm. going on That's and so really cool. I'm part of that mm-hmm. wave and there's a vulnerability in standing up in that and and going am I going to be good enough am I going to stand up to my own expectations of what I want to deliver right. when do you feel the most vulnerable 
Oh, there's so many times I feel... I mean, you know, I would say basically I'm pretty much vulnerable 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Why do you think that is? Is it because you are not hiding like or yeah and I don't see it as a weakness mm-hmm. um can you give an example though a specific example of or, well, or every time I teach every mm-hmm. time I teach I'm terrified I don't want to do it I want to go home <laughs> I just wish I was growing vegetables <laughs> selling vegetables um wish I had you know a cucumber shop I always want to sell cucumbers maybe it's because I'm Polish ancestry I just think of pickles. well you have really good cucumbers <laughs> in your water <laughs> <laughs> um I just think yeah, it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable. It's you feel- vulnerable revealing oneself, mm-hmm. whether that's in a class in front of 130 people. I have a full commitment to fully stepping into being utterly present and, again, speaking the unspeakable and speaking what I'm seeing that's not being named and making jokes and being rude and burping and laughing and crying and getting angry and owning my own stuff and owning the stuff being in the like room. Being like the... Be- Essentially, like modeling for the whole class, like yeah. the just presence, being human. the embodied. I'm just completely yeah. human. I suppose modeling for them that they're okay to, to like, be yeah, all parts of themselves. Like, just be fucking real. It's like so fun, and um, and and being brave. I think it's just about being brave. But I think you know, courage and fear hold hands all the time. Any other like small moment that where you feel like you're just in life, just being. You're well, like, yeah, going into a room and just no one saying hello, you know, and just going, oh, or a really vulnerable situation is my um, niece was um, bat mitzvahed last year in New York City, and I have a brother, and they're practicing Jews, and and I went to the synagogue and the party, and I definitely didn't look like any other woman in that synagogue. I mean, everyone had the long hair and the blonde highlights Mm. and looked very appropriate and I was like wearing fluorescent red and yellow and I think my hair I had a big bright red streak and I I kind of walked in and I felt like Bathsheba you know like Lilith rising and hairy and smelly and also felt like a kind of wild lesbian and that made me very happy that they thought that of me so just those levels of vulnerability where you step into a tribe where you absolutely are other Mm -hmm. and there's nothing about your the cells that resonate with their cells and ended up dancing with all the teenage girls on the dance floor and that was fantastic but you know those moments where you know you don't belong and how do you Hmm. navigate that with grace and not act out not resent anyone not judge anyone not criticize anyone just be in the environment and go oh this is really different from my day-to-day experience and these are beautiful people it's just they're living their lives in a really different way and so are you and they think you're weird and you think they're weird but actually you can come together and it's great and (laughs) That's what I've loved about maturity is that Mm -hmm. that there's a place that we can meet in the middle, right? In the center of things. Mm -hmm. If one is brave enough and can breathe long enough and talk to oneself enough to just stay and not flee. Mm -hmm. When do you feel the most joy? Oh, well, as we said, dancing, um, eating, spending time with my friends, making love and kissing my husband, cuddling my sons, um, being in water. Reading great books. Oh, what's books the last make one? Me so happy. What's the last? The one? Forty Rules of Love <laughs> is the one I'm reading right now. Great literature, fucking makes me the happiest. That was the thing I missed the most when I had my younger son. I was just m- missed books like they were my daily lover. Um, great art, sleep, <laughs> being in bed, watching great television. And when do you feel the most beautiful? When I'm in the eyes of being witnessed with love is when I feel my most beautiful. So that could just be going down to the local supermarket and with a loaf of bread and a little two-year-old looks at me and loves me because they think I'm the kind of strangest looking creature they've seen all day and it just makes them happy. And I go, you know, so I think presence makes me feel the most beautiful. When I feel I'm someone is taking in my presence Mm -hmm. like fully and I know that they're not kind of dissecting me because mm-hmm. we can hear their thoughts, you know, and, thoughts, and yeah. thoughts become things. And so when it's not a thing, it's a being. Mm-hmm. I love it when we are in a being state. Um, and that can be with my beloveds and utter strangers, you know, like falling in love, basically, with no story and with no attachment. Just presence makes me feel beautiful and makes me feel so delighted and hopeful. What does self-acceptance mean to you? <laughs> They didn't tell me what the questions were going to be. Um, self-acceptance. Did I accept all my 
quirks and foibles and that I equally accept all my beauty and glory and kindness and sweetness and vulnerability and that I I don't worry so much that everyone's going to think I'm a crazy horrible person Why would you think that people would think you? Yeah. Because I think when you have a tendency to be very loud and brash, you think that that might be, again, coming full circle, what people think you are rather than this kind of multidimensional sphere. Um, right. So self-acceptance means that I can get under my own self-critic and project that onto somebody else that they're thinking that about me, basically. So at the end of the day, it's coming back to Kate you know love that bit a little bit more girl you know and and accept that people do have more grace than you might have around yourself <laughs> one hopes right and that's the thing one hopes because i do think we can be our greatest critic much more so than anyone else and how do i want people to think about me when i leave a room you know all those kinds of things we leave a trace you know everything leaves a trace human beings leave a trace as much as trash leaves a trace so i'm hoping that I'm inspiring in a good way and an exciting, you know, a little bit of an edge and paprika way too. I will tell you that you are everything that you hope. (laughs) (laughs) I am going to... You want to write it down? No, I mean, you can call me up. (laughs) Anytime. Thank you. Yeah, I know that. I'm knowing that more and more. But also it feels important to just also be that transparent and go, yeah, that's tricky. And I'll be dancing those tricky moves for the rest of my life, but hopefully with more kindness and balance, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a wild ride being a human being. Mm -hmm. It is a fucking wild (laughs) ride. I agree. Being the elder in this room right now. And I have been stepping into my elder for the first time too. I I, I also feel like, uh, weirdly enough, I'm still feeling like a young elder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I still, I feel like a junior elder, but I'm getting into it. <laughs> the inner t- teenager is alive and well at so all times. So alive like, and well. You know. Her, hers is for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Roaring. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so that much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Amazing thank and you. beautiful and everything. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of our podcast, What's Underneath. Hi, I'm Lily. <laughs> and I'm Elisa, Lily's mom. And we're the creators of Style Like You. Do you want to talk a little bit about our sponsor? Yes. So uh, we wanted to say from the bottom of our heart, a huge, huge thank you to Matt Hippie, an amazing skincare line that make beautiful, beautiful products in beautiful bottles and boxes and with natural and organic ingredients that make you feel absolutely amazing. And they are committing to reducing the carbon imprint on the planet. You should also be aware that Matt Hippie is now making a makeup line that has an array of amazing colors. All of Matt Hippie's products, including their makeup, have no synthetic dyes, no silicone, and are completely vegan and cruelty-free. Matt Hippie is being super generous and offering Style Like You viewers 20% off their products for the next month after watching this video. So you can get 20% off by going to madhippie.com and using the coupon code STYLE at checkout. And if you are inspired by our message of self-acceptance, it would be so amazing if you could help spread the word by subscribing to our YouTube channel, joining us on Patreon, sharing this episode. And don't forget to ring the bell so you can be notified when we have a new video. There's many, many coming up. And your support and your participation of watching our videos and being part of our YouTube channel means everything to us. And without you, this movement for acceptance wouldn't be happening. Bye, everyone. Bye.